Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for joining us for this session. I was thinking which language should I make this presentation. So parts of this presentation has already been presented to stakeholders in Russian. So yeah, I'll do this one in English. Yeah, this uh, research was funded by the UK, um, by this project. And we did it together with my colleague Evgeny and Gulbara. So thank you very much to them. And um, um, we were thinking about vegetation trends and analysis in Tajikistan and Kyrgyzstan borderlands. And uh, talking exactly about our uh, study area uh, for the study site, we chose uh, Isfara region here in the south of Kyrgyzstan. Uh, which is, uh, the, so Isfara is a transboundary uh, river that starts in Kyrgyzstan, then flows through uh, Tajik exclave Varukh, then back to Kyrgyz area, then to Tajik area, and then it goes to uh, Uzbekistan where it joins the uh, Big Fergana channel and flows to the Tajik Sea water reservoir. So yeah, this is our study site. Um, and our research actually consists of three big parts. First part, uh, we were trying to um, analyze the historical data, runoff days of Isfara River and temperature and precipitation in the area, trying to understand what's the, what's the impact of temperature and precipitation on runoff in the area, what are historical trends. In second part, we um, applied remote sensing and used more recent data uh, from the um, 21st century to identify what's the impact of uh, temperature and vegetation on the runoff and what's the impact of runoff and precipitation temperature on the vegetation resources in the area, uh, on croplands and on rangelands in the area. And in the third part of this study, uh, we try to see uh, what are the perceptions of local people um, how do they see if the climate changes, if it's not, or if natural resources are, changes, um, are changing, what's, what is their perception of the natural resources and of the livelihoods? So first of all, let's talk about the first part of this study. I'll be talking fast because the time is limited, so <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, um, so, um, these are our research questions. So basically, we're trying, uh, we tried to understand what was the impact of the climatic factors on the runoff of the Isfara River. We used the Isfara data runoff from the Global Runoff Data Center um, uh, uh, from the year uh, which uh, covers the time period of years 1933 to 1991, uh, which are monthly uh, runoff data. Then we also use the modern runoff data received from Small Basin Council of the Isfara River. We also use precipitation and air temperature, which were measured at Soviet times at Tangi Varukh Station in, in Varukh um, from the Central Asia temperature and precipitation uh, data organization. All these are monthly time series uh, showing the temperature, uh, precipitation, and runoff uh, of the river. So this is the small comparison of the data. Here you see um, uh, the box plots of our precipitation, how precipitation is distributed throughout the year and different months. And here you can see the temperature. You can see the precipitation is the highest in, in May and temperature is the highest in July, as expected. And this is the comparison of two um, um, uh, Israel River um, runoff data, the historical data and the modern data. You see uh, this uh, brown dot here they mean the significant change between this period and this period. And you can see that runoff in summer has increased. And basically, in, in all the other, other um, months, except in April, May, June, and October, and November, we can see a significant increase from old times to present times, which corresponds to um, other researches done in the region, um, um, basically devoted to glacier mass balance measurements. They say that the glaciers are shrinking because the temperature is rising, which causes increase in runoff because all this uh, water uh, that were captured in the glaciers, they start to, um, to disperse. And so this, this causes the increase in runoff in Central Asian uh, rivers, mountain rivers. So this is the method analysis. Uh, we um, uh, took the time series of runoff, precipitation, air temperature, and we did the um, STL trend decomposition. Basically, this picture illustrates what we did. So. Um, uh, for example, let's say this is initial data. We can see the clear seasonality and the trend, which is rising. So this procedure basically uh, discriminates, uh, splits 
the initial data to trend component and seasonal component and reminder, the error component. So if you sum them up all together, you will get the initial data. So this is basically what we did, uh, what I mean by the seasonal and trend decomposition. Then we've got the, um, the trend components of runoff precipitation and temperature and seasonal components. And we did the cross correlation analysis uh, between runoff and these variables. So this is what we've got. What cross correlation actually means that we try to correlate um, different variables between now and now. For example, um, yeah, we, you can expect that runoff will react to temperature increase. Not now, if the temperature increases tomorrow, then maybe runoff will increase. Uh, if temperature increases today, then maybe runoff will increase tomorrow. So we better correlate the tomorrow data of runoff with today's values of, co of uh, temperature. This is basically means the cross correlation. So if we correlate the two variables between now and now, uh, we say that the uh, correlation lag is zero between now and one month ago, we say the correlation lag is one. Uh, between now and two months ago, uh, we say the correlation lag is two. And all these uh, charts here, they actually, uh, they show the correlation uh, coefficients uh, of, cor of correlation of different uh, components uh, with different lags. So here, you can see the correlation of runoff and precipitation. So um, uh, they're basically positive, and uh, which indicates that, that uh, runoff reacts to precipitation. And these are actually the, uh, the components. So the blue um, curve is precipitation, red is temperature, and cyan is runoff. So you can see, as we saw before on the box plot, that um, runoff, uh, the precipitation is highest in, in April, whereas the runoff is highest in, at the hottest time in summer, which indicates the, um, the role that glaciers play. They capture the, glacier, uh, the glaciers and snow fields. They capture the precipitation in form of rain and snow in spring when it's not very hot. And, and then they discharge it in the hottest, in, in hot time in summer. And these are the trend components. So let me go to the next one. So the, here are the results uh, that we indicated before on this correlation charts. The runoff and seasonal component peak comes three months after precipitation because of glaciers. When glaciers disappear, uh, we can say that the uh, um, runoff will, will be the highest in, in spring when precipitation is the highest. So uh, because there are no, no glacier to cause the postponing effect of uh, um, um, of capturing the, the water in spring and then dispersing it later in the hottest time in summer. And run, sorry. Um, run of seasonal components peak together with the temperature, uh, which makes sense. It's hot, glaciers are melting, so we can see the increase of runoff straight away. Uh, the not runoff and trend components precipitation correlation greatest at eight months lag, which actually means that um, the runoff of Isfara River is basically uh, made of uh, rains in um, in um, April and uh, and May and snow in November and December. So these times of precipitation are the most crucial for forming the the amount of water in Isfara that we will get in summer. So yeah, here are some conclusions. And let's go to the next study. So the next study, we were an analyzing the modern data of, so this before this was historical data of Soviet times from 1933 um, till, 1980, uh, till 1991. So now let's see uh, what the modern um, uh, situation looks like. So for our uh, data analysis, we use the Landsat images which are free, the satellite images from the year 2013 to 2018 with special, uh, why we use the satellite images because they're free. You can increase special resolution to 15 meters, which is okay for us. So one pixel will be as big as 15 meters. Um, uh, we also use the land surface temperature of the special resolution of one twentieth uh, of a degree. Um, and we used precipitation data from Kyrgyz Hydromet and Ispara River water discharge um, from um, the, the water council. So here are the methods. So what we basically did is we, did, uh, we took the, the satellite images of the uh, monthly span. So we, we had satellite images for every month. From the year 2013 to the year 2018, we increased the uh, a special resolution to 15 meters. We get rid of all those images with clouds that had more than 40% of the scene covered with clouds. 
then we covered the whole the cloud holes with a special procedure uh, which is called clo closed gaps with stepwise resampling and then from that we calculated the normalized difference vegetation index what it basically mean is that we conducted the vegetation index for each pixel from the satellite images the vegetation index spans from the values of minus 1 to plus 1 if it's from 0 to minus 1 it that would mean that there is no vegetation in this area if it's from um, the values from from the 0 to plus 1 the greater the value is the more vegetation you you basically get in the pixel Um, then we also uh, conducted the, uh, the trend and seasonal decomposition for all this data, for land surface temperature, for NDVI, which is basically the vegetation vitality in the area for precipitation. And water discharge, we also did all the cross-correlation analysis with this, and we also did the, the, poly, uh, the polynomial trend from grids analysis, which is basically approximating the trends of the... Mm, Normalized digital, digital vegetation index of NDVI with a linear um, least squares uh, approximation. So we did a linear regression to see what's the trend of uh, vegetation in the area. So this is the results of uh, the NDVI polynomial trend. Uh, the red area, the, the, the green areas are the good areas. It means where the, uh, shows where the vegetation is increasing. Uh, the red areas are the bad areas. Vegetation is decreasing in these areas. Uh, the trend is negative. So basically, the areas, uh, this, these are the agricultural areas, this here, and this is already Uzbekistan, also agricultural areas. So you can zoom um, very closely and see which fields exactly show positive trends and negative trends. So you can use this data to go to these households or farmers and ask them what's going on, what's happening, why your field is showing a negative vegetation trend, or what do you do that you've got such a good positive trend? Please teach your neighbor <laughs> so he does the same thing. Uh, to his plot, and uh, what you see that that all the areas, the rangelands, which are not involved in agricultural production, they all show the, uh, all red, nearly all red, all red. They show negative uh, trends. Uh, these areas are actually used as pastures. Uh, local farmers take their cattle, li livestock to these areas to graze, and they look like deserts. These areas are virtually deserts, and uh, they the livestock eats out all the grass, and you can see negative. Um, uh, trend in these areas, and these areas high in the mountains, they show positive trends, which are also actually postures, which indicates that um, local farmers, they pr prefer the easiest way, they prefer to take the livestock to the plain areas rather than getting them high in the mountains to eat all this grass. Some of these areas are actually juniper forests, over here and over here, but these areas are all grasslands. Um, this is another lag correlation analysis. Um, as you saw before, you can see that, that for, for the modern data, you can see the precipitation, the blue precipitation peaks in spring, uh, uh, runoff peaks in summer, red is temperature, and green is vegetation. You can see that vegetation is, uh, uh, comes very close with temperature, which means that actually there is enough of water resources. There is, uh, the irrigation is enough in the area. So uh, temperature is not a limiting factor, but rather temperature is a promoting factor for vegetation because when it gets hot, when, when it's summer, the vegetation, the agricultural vegetation starts growing, um, and it's not limited by temperature. It doesn't go down in the hottest time. It goes up, so so we can say that irrigation water for for this amount of irrigation productivity that we have as, a mo as at the moment for this area of agricultural areas is enough. This water is enough now for for all these agricultural areas. If we want to expand uh, uh, the agricultural areas to all those red areas that we saw before, to this you can actually some of these areas were, were involved in agriculture before. We have to um, conserve or save water somehow. Introduce water conservation uh, technologies like um, constructing cemented ditches, um, pipe, what's that called, uh, 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 mulching, pl using plastic for mulching the area to, uh, to prevent ever, uh, ever transpiration and use drip irrigation systems to uh, conserve water, to provide more water, to involve more agricultural land and productivity, to provide more jobs for local communities, to provide more income. What we also can do is we can use groundwater. There is enough of groundwater resources in these areas. Uh, drill uh, uh, the whales and use the groundwater to irrigate and involve these areas in agricultural production. 
Um, this is the result of um, regression analysis. So what we try to do is we try to predict the NDVI vegetation vitality with precipitation on this map and with water discharge on this map. Here red is not bad. Red means that the, these areas are very much conditioned by precipitation. And red on this map means that these areas are very much conditioned by discharge. You can see that for agriculture, agriculture is very much conditioned by water discharge from Isfara River, whereas it's not conditioned by precipitation at all. So precipitation doesn't play a direct role for agriculture because it, it's not great in this area. Uh, it plays a secondary role because uh, the more uh, precipitation comes, the more um, uh, water get conserved in glaciers here. And then in summer, it gets, uh, I mean, into the river and, you, and being used for irrigation in the area. So irrigation is very much important in this area, more important than rainfall or whatever. And this uh, caused the lags of the highest uh, R squared, so to say, the, um, 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 uh, actually this means that these areas um, uh, react to precipitation, they do react to precipitation because vegetation does react to precipitation, not as strong as to water, uh, irrig uh, as to, uh, water discharge in Isfara, as to irrigation, but to precipitation, but later, uh, with about three months lag. Whereas uh, vegetation reacts nearly straight away to, to uh, water discharge in Isfara River, to irrigation, which again, um, shows that um, water discharge and, and irrigation is very much important in this area, more important than precipitation. Yeah, I'm, to, I'm, I'm speaking three minutes more. <laughs> I will finish soon. <laughs> um, so these are the basic conclusions of the second part of the research. Um, actually, I'm rushing through my presentation, but we've got the poster devoted to this research over there and a publication as well. If you want to study it in more detail, please grab your copy and you can sit down home with a cup of tea or coffee and read it and, and understand better from what I'm trying to say here. The third part is analysis of local communities' perception of climate change and natural resources. Well, we developed a semi-structured questionnaire, went to local communities to ask them what's their perception on natural resources and um, climate change. So we had questions on climate change awareness. We tried to understand how aware they are on if what climate change is, what causes climate change, if it's bad or good, what do they think, uh, what do they see every day if precipitation is increasing, if it's not, if temperature is increasing, if it's not, and natural resource trends, and we all that submitted to contingency table, table analysis and to go over this distance clustering, which is, yeah, the hierarchical cluster using uh, nominative data for calculating the distance for dividing between the clusters. And we, in total, we questioned 152 people in all these villages, and plus we had three experts from Batkan area. We tried to see what the expert understanding of the situation. So this, we divided all the respondents in three clusters. And here is uh, what the clusters are. So. Um, uh, as we saw at the end, the clusters actually divided between the villages. Uh, different, different clusters basically mean different villages. The first cluster, red dot, you can see them on the map, is Samarkandik village, basically Samarkandik. Yeah, some of, from other villages also fell in this cluster, but the majority was from Samarkandik village. They are all the downstream river. This is a downstream river um, village. The second cluster, uh, mid, mid uh, stream, so to say, villages, and the blue, the third cluster is upstream villages. They all have different opinion. What they all agree on is that temperature is increasing, precipitation is decreasing in the area. They said that for the last two or three years, they haven't had any snow at all in winter. Um, what they disagree on is that if uh, the runoff in, if the water in the river is increasing or decreasing. The downstream villages, they say that the water is decreasing, Basically, maybe because they, um, they have more demand for water because they also say that the orchards are increasing and they demand more water. So the, maybe they percept that the water is decreasing because their demand for water is increasing. But maybe it is decreasing. Whereas the upstream villages, they say that the water, the, uh, the runoff is not increasing. It's the same as it was before. And the downstream villages' income strategy is basically what they, they do. They switch uh, from different sorts of agriculture to, uh, uh, to growing apricots, to orchards. And upstream villages, for their livelihoods, they basically do livestock, which 
I'm sorry, which actually makes sense because these, these guys live in plain areas, uh, the, uh, uh, the temperature is high in these areas, so they plant more orchards, whereas these guys, they have access to, to the pastures and they take their livestock to, to the pastures, so, so uh, livestock prevails in their, li in their um, um, livelihoods. And there are some results. You can actually read uh, all of them in the publication. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you to all these agencies and to UK. And I'm sorry <laughs> I took too much of your time. Thank you very much. If you have any questions, uh, you can ask in the que questions and answers section. Thank you.